Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth Atlassian Town Hall. We are waiting for Michael to come here and we... Oh, here it is. What's up, what's up, what's up? How are you, man? I'm good. We were just having our uh, company happy hour, Friday uh, happy, well, happy half, half hour, I guess it was. So. <laughs> Do you have a beer for today? You know, as a matter of fact, I did. I had a gold nail. That's good, that's good. So if you are new here, this is the, the classic Atlassian Town Hall, where we ask Michael questions about literally everything, and we keep you guys updated on everything that's going on inside Star Atlas. You guys ask questions, and I just make up answers on the fly. <laughs> so if you, if you want, Michael, we can start today. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on the last two weeks inside Star Atlas? Ah, uh, man, I don't even remember two weeks ago. We are moving at light speed here. Um, uh, I, you know, I guess, I guess what I'll just kind of focus on for this week, which is really where my attention has been, um, most of my attention has been dedicated is uh, across kind of two, two categories. One, we had a very busy and active week in, in uh, interviews. Uh, so, you know, community generated content uh, with YouTubers and uh, with podcast producers. So we'll have, uh, you know, six pieces coming out within the next couple of days or the next week or so uh, with a lot of questions asked about kind of the latest status of Star Atlas and things like economics. And then that's been another big focus on my part. Uh, we've we fully on ramped our external economic team through Republic Co, and uh, we also have onboarded a few members to our internal economic team, and so we are uh, kind of deep in the trenches right now, working through restructuring and and assessments on things like tokenomics, uh, which will address uh, specifically the utility and value creation for Atlas and Polis and uh, corporate financial modeling, which we leverage heavily internal to determine our ability to scale, our ability to invest in new projects and new partnerships um, into our team itself uh, to ensure that we can uh, continue forward as a going concern as a company and uh, you know, ultimately be able to deliver all of the features that we are promoting and discussing uh, in all of our active communications. And then also game economics and game balance, which will speak specifically to those methods and avenues that the uh, community will have or the player base will have to be able to extract value from the Star Atlas metaverse. Um, and that will include components related to the mini game and the feature set therein, uh, as well as you know longer term prospects of the fully immersive Unreal Engine version of the game. So uh, I, I would say, you know, we have a, we have probably five major events coming up between uh, today and the official launch of the mini game. And uh, that will include the release of two technical documents, one specifically on tokenomics, a tokenomics white paper, as well as a game economics white paper. So a lot of information for you to consume and absorb uh, and leverage in your strategic decision making um, related to which types of assets you want to buy when they become available. Um, we also have the launch of a new website, uh, which is fully immersive and information dense and really nicely stylized um, that will be coming out in advance of the mini game launch, uh, a teaser trailer that is full cinematic quality, kind of your first look at, uh, at what the potential universe of Star Atlas will, will look like um when you know in the future when we release the unreal engine version of the game so that's uh we're very excited about that we think that's going to inspire a lot of imagination in in um in, amongst all of you and amongst the you know the future user base of star atlas and then um also you know up and coming and much anticipated is the is the token generation event where we'll we'll launch the official public sale of atlas and polis tokens to be distributed to the public uh, which you would then be able to use either in gameplay, in real governance, or um, you know, pure speculation. So, um, very exciting things coming. Uh, you know, we're we're certainly going to be quite active with you all in communications over the next couple of months, and we we know everyone's really excited to start playing the game. And trust me, we are just as excited as you internally um, to get this game developed, get it released, and uh, and and to get people playing. 
Well, thank you, Michael, for all the details. You really make it really easy for me to ask you questions. You really go into detail. Uh, and I also have seen a little bit of the the website, new website, and it looks awesome. So I think everyone's gonna is going to love it. Everything. Yeah, it, this this will be your gateway to the metaverse. Is is one of the kind of fundamental concepts that we wanted to introduce with the release of this new website. And you know, the other thing that to, to me is really quite attractive, and uh, you know, a lot of credit to the team for driving in this direction. Uh, you know, our 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 team, all departments collaborating cohesively, um, is really the, the the style that we're presenting for the Star Atlas website is. A, it really bucks the trend in what is presented for most sci-fi themed space exploration concepts in general and games in particular. So um, I, I don't want to reveal too much, but but you know, effectively the color scheme and the color palette um, that we're going to be introducing is very uh, warm and welcoming. It's it's not the dark cold metal space that you're accustomed to in sci-fi. And so uh, we hope you're pleased. We're really excited about the launch, but. Um, yeah, just uh, you know, a little bit of time to wait for it, but it's it's going to be a really beautiful experience when it gets launched. Awesome, awesome. So I have a question here from the community that has been asked a lot, and and we want to know more details. And it's about the pre-sales of the of the posters, the full tier posters. Do you have Do you have any details to give to us? Yeah, I mean, we so uh, the the pre sales or the private sales of the posters were largely presented to our existing stakeholders. Um, these are you know venture capital groups or private investors uh, that were able to accumulate a larger allocation from us initially, and we presented them with an opportunity to pre purchase the entire set of posters. Um, you know, I'm I'm happy to reveal that we pre sold four complete sets of posters. Uh, there was some some modest discount pricing on that, but ultimately, you know, the end result for us is that we were able to generate close to $2 million in revenue as a company uh, because of these pre-sales. Uh, we also had some assurance that there would be complete sets out there in circulation so that uh, at some point in the distant future, when, when Star Atlas uh, sees a user base of, you know, potentially 100 million or a billion people that are active and participating in the metaverse, um, that there will be... Uh, uh, you know, uh, virtual copies of every single poster uh, that could be accumulated required at some point later. So um, it, it's super exciting one, because that revenue is really what drives uh, our continuous development. And, you know, I would assure you all that what we're doing is reinvesting every single dollar quite aggressively into the growth of the team and into various activities um, uh, across the company that allow us to continue to expand and continue to develop out the highest quality experiences that we can deliver to to you all as a gamer and um, and so uh, you know across across both of those facets uh, us being able to generate revenue and reinvest into uh, into the company growing from four people to over 75 people that's a pretty obvious and clear metric that we are reinvesting capital right back into into the team and to our talent pool. But, um, you know, again, at the fact that there will be posters out there from 1 through 14 in circulation is, is a great uh, demonstration that there is interest in, in what we're creating. And, and it's just encouraging for us to see that people actually went out and were interested in buying all of this digital art, this historic moment, and, and wanting to capture a, a piece of time through Star Atlas. That's great, Michael. Thank you again. This was a question that was really asked in the community channel. So thanks for the update on this. And uh, I'll, I'll, jump. Just, I'll just elaborate uh, slightly more and uh, let everyone know that we do have communications that are uh, being written currently that will uh, um, provide a summary of all of the sales of all of the posters um, in, in definite numbers. Um, as well as uh, a breakdown of the total loot boxes that were distributed out um, once we complete that snapshot and distribution process of the loot crates. So uh, we very much care about transparency with, with our community. We want everybody to have all of the information. We just try to structure this information in a timely fashion when we have all of the information available to us 
um, so that we can inform you of that. So, you know, we're never sitting here holding back on information. Uh, we are just waiting for the complete picture ourselves so we can present to you all the most accurate um, picture of current status of, of events. Okay. So let's go into a cool question I have here that is more like in game question. It says if the game is a universe, where is the center of the game? It's a really, it's a really fantastic question. And in, in um, a short amount of time, we'll probably be releasing information about the Star Atlas, which is kind of the namesake of the game and also represents, uh, you know, the, the global or rather universal map of, of the entire universe and how the territories are broken down, how the factions are broken down, how the security zones uh, divide up and, um, uh, you know, I mean, there is there is a center point. It is, uh, and, and the three factions are developed around the center point. And the way that we are crafting it into lore is really around the first poster, which is the discovery of Iris. Uh, uh, the discovery Iris of Iris captures the the cataclysm moment. So, in lore, um, all of the factions have effectively created outposts and stations surrounding this. Um, this major collision of planets because it's the area of densest materials with uh, the rarest minerals that can be extracted. And so naturally, everybody wants a strategic location surrounding that so they can get access to the wealth and riches that can be created because of it. So, so the cataclysm event is effectively the center of the universe. It will also be um, entirely within the deep space or the high risk zone within the universe. So if you want access to those resources um, and those riches, you're going to have to battle it out uh, in high stakes, high risk gameplay, where you can actually lose your ship. Uh, you can lose your assets uh, if you lose an engagement. So you'll have to be crafty in how you navigate that area to get access to those things. But uh, yeah, I guess in a nutshell, uh, Cataclysm and all of the best resources are directly in the center um, and will be uh, part of a battle royale scenario for anybody who wants to get access to them. And then the rest of the universe just expands out around that. You have to be prepared to go there. So I have a question that has to do with this. And it's uh, so when we start, we buy or receive one faction passport. Can we visit the space of the other two factions? Are there cost involved? Another good question. So we're we're working through some of the details of that and the economics of that. Um, in the immediate term, there will be some value attributed to the passport itself. Um, the way we're looking at structuring factions initially is to have a uh, irreversible selection um, as a component of the onboarding process to new pilots in space. Um, uh, so your You'll select a faction which will give you, you know, the right to navigate around in that territory. Uh, you know, at least in from economic terms, you would be paying taxes or generating value or GDP um, in within your your faction itself. And so that's kind of a, it's a permanent selection that has implications for the expansion of borders and competition across borders over time. But um, naturally, players would want to go into other uh, territories where it, it, it will be risky for players to explore into an opposing factions, uh, medium risk or even low risk territories. But um, what needs to take place is open commerce. And so the, the faction passports will probably be centered around your ability to trade and transact with individuals across op opposing factions. So uh, some work still to be done there to determine exactly how they'll be utilized, but that's our that's our current uh, kind of projected delivery mo model. Okay, okay, sounds really great. So, other question is, how will the total number of systems in Star Atlas will be determined? It's a pretty hard one, this question. It's actually it, so. It's not. It's not um, all that difficult. So we're we're what we're doing right now um, across our economic modeling and analysis is to um, first and foremost start with a competitive analysis of the gaming landscape across blockchain games. So the uh, the intended output from that analysis is to determine 
uh, what our potential initial user base looks like. And we'll, you know, we should probably pull, pull Pablo up here. I see him out there in the, uh, in the audience. I'm going to invite him to speak uh, because he could probably speak a little bit to the marketing tech stack that we're developing out right now with our internal statistical analysts. And uh, so a big piece of this is going to be, um, it is going to be uh, using things like surveys uh, as well as just publicly available and accessible data. So through Google Analytics, uh, through our own portal, through blockchain analysis, um, to kind of assess what the what the potential initial user base will be, um, and this allows us to define the amount of assets that we're going to be selling, because we do want to ensure that that rarity exists. Right, there needs to be a drive and a demand for assets going into the future, and so we don't want to oversaturate the market in whatever we sell. We're not selfishly driven. Um, which would would indicate that we you know we really don't care how many assets we sell we just want to maximize our revenues so that's not the perspective of the company the company is how many uh, what is the quantity or total value of revenue that we can generate that maintains a, a persistent economy um, and a and a kind of um, uh, uh, positive feedback loop within the economy for both the players and for us uh, so we're not only sharing ownership of ownership capability through things like NFTs, but we're sharing in the upside potential of the ownership of those NFTs as well. And so um, the first step is to really create a baseline, uh, which is where our economic analysis and competitive, competitive analysis comes into play. Uh, and then ultimately going into the future, we'll use a variety of metrics to determine when, uh, when we can actually expand. And that would be based on things like growth in user adoption. So how many daily active players do we have? Um, growth in uh, GDP across all of the factions or across the universe overall. So as, as economic uh, transactions take place, uh, we know that there's more activity in the game, which inherently means that there's more time being spent in the game. Um, and then also looking at deflationary factors, like how many ships are being destroyed over time as a result of participation in deep space or, or um, uh, high risk gameplay. And so, we can utilize those as variable inputs to create an algorithm or formula that determines how and when we can actually expand the universe, which is to say that we would create more planets, we would allow for the issuance of new claim stakes and more land, um, as well as the creation of new NFTs that we sell, such as ships or crew members or components or modules. So that's the way we're thinking about it today. It all needs to be carefully balanced out and uh, what's important is that we kind of maintain this um, modest deflation uh, in the economy uh, from the perspective of asset issuance, not necessarily from financial activity that takes place. Um, because things like Atlas as a transactional currency, and as we've seen on a kind of on a global scale, there is very much this um, necessity to create some modest rate of inflation to continue to um, uh, encourage the spending of this transactional currency, this lubricant of the ecosystem. If your currency is deflationary, then the inherent human behavior is to uh, save and, and not spend. And uh, that's not the type of dynamic that you want for an asset like Atlas, although for Polis, um, you know, having this, uh, uh, well, having a deflationary component, but also a value accrual component is actually a positive aspect or, or positive, uh, call it feature of that. So we, we're, you know, we, we are carefully balancing out the, um, the crypto native assets that we issue and the dynamics of those assets, as well as the NFT assets that we issue uh, to determine a, uh, you know, an, a, 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 well, to determine that balance and formula that, uh, would justify us being able to is issue new assets over time. Wow, man. That was really detailed. Here's where we know that you are a CFA charter holder. All the details. So... Inquiring minds would like to know. Uh, we want to make sure you all have all of the information. Okay. Let's jump into a more gameplay question. It's, uh, will ships uh, will I be able to upgrade my ships? For example, can I outfit my jet jet with better armor or higher capacity guns or fastest power plant? 
absolutely. Uh, at least within the uh, at least within the class of your ship. So the class is determined by the size. Hey, Pablo. Hey, hey! I heard uh, Jet Jet. What's popping? <laughs> We were just talking about the marketing tech stack a little bit. I figured I'd invite you up here in case you wanted to cover that at all. Um, I know it's it's kind of more in, in AJ's wheelhouse, but uh, I think we're kind of moving on from that question nevertheless. So hey, welcome to uh, contribute a comment, though, if you're interested. Hi, everyone. How's, how's everyone doing? I hope you're doing great. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, stand by in case uh, I can jump in on any of the questions. Welcome to the stage, Pablo. So yeah, I mean, within the within the range of your ship class, you'll be able to upgrade. Uh, we have a, a five tier uh, skill rating system throughout all of the assets. So that's that exists on claim stakes, it exists on land, it exists on mining equipment, it exists on your ships and the components and modules that go into the ship. Um, so. What will happen over time is, uh, and what we anticipate to happen over time, is that people will actually take revenue that they're able to generate through the game. And, you know, in theory, the optimal strategy would be to reinvest that capital back into upgrading your equipment so that you, you are able to earn a, a higher rate of return in the future. So it, it's, you know, while that's not a requirement, um, it will be beneficial for players to actually reinvest early earnings back into their assets so that they can generate more going forward as well as be more competitive, um, whether that be in deep space, uh, high risk zone, or just being able to perform the functions of a particular career. And so um, on your ship, you will be able to upgrade from tier one components up to tier five components, tier five. Uh, being the best, and your, uh, and that would include things like shields, like weapons, uh, uh, thrusters, um, power cells, you know, uh, virtually any inventory item that could be slotted into your ship loadout can be upgraded from tier one up to tier five. And likewise, on your, as I said, on your mining equipment, your mining drill, for example, could be tier one or it could be tier five. And the higher the quality or the higher the grade, um, the the more you can monetize that asset. Awesome, completely awesome. I just want to know how we can go from listening to like Radiohead to Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> how do we do that, man? Well, Pablo, that's a loaded question because you know the answer. But um, for those of you out there uh, that are familiar with Audius, uh, we are working through our relationship with them, wherein you'll actually be able to listen live stream to uh, on-chain radio uh, within your spaceship. So when you're navigating space, you can either listen to your own soundtrack on Spotify, you can listen to um, our audio soundscapes that we're going to be producing for the game, or you can tap right into Audius and just play a radio station or play an artist um, that, that you're interested in listening to. Um, and all of this will be done directly on the dashboard within your spaceship. There we go. That's <laughs> something. Right, Cheers. That's really good info, man. We all want to listen to some some tracks when we are traveling around the space. Let's jump into a question about the Armstrong poster. We know that we have some Armstrong holders here. So our patch spacesuit satellite from Armstrong Poster rewards. Uh, be purely cosmetic, or do they have in-game utility? Pablo, why don't you take that one? So, um, you know, Pablo was really the the kind of point of contact with the Neil Armstrong estate um, uh, in conjunction with uh, SpaceX and the uh, and the U.S. Space Force to create that asset. Um, it really amazing, great work, Pablo. Yeah, would love to get your 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 thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the question, Santi? Drop it again. So the question is if the rewards that are in, inside the, the Armstrong poster, for example, like the patch, spacesuit, or satellite, will be purely cosmetic or will they have in-game utility? Sure. Um, yeah, just to give some context to, to any, uh, anyone in the audience um, who doesn't know about the Armstrong um, NFT drop. Uh, you know, hey, the game is called Star Atlas right uh stars uh humans 
planet Earth? Well, there's a lot of humans that have for a long time now been uh, in, in a race uh, to go uh, touch the stars, pass the stars, eat the stars. Uh, and, and one of those was Neil Armstrong. Um, you know, in a, in a couple, uh, I think, days or weeks, uh, there's going to be another one going up there because uh, there's a race and they're calling it the billionaire race uh, where you have Richard Branson uh, and uh, uh, I forget the guy's name, it's <laughs> the guy from Amazon. Uh, but, you know, both of them are out there racing to get into outer space and they're going to do it. Right. So you got Bezos. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. You got Bezos and you got Branson, uh, you know, cr you know, funding uh, self-capital um, to to create their spaceships to go to outer space. Well, I think, you know, there's a variety of, of reasons and missions uh, for us humans to, to want to do this. Um, it's, it, it was a historical moment that uh, humanity, uh, you know, uh, created for itself. Um, thinking about metaverses, thinking about game, thinking about lore, um, the way we're approaching this, you know, I think it's just like turning the shirt inside out. Literally bringing the metaverse into where we are not the other way around. I know we're going to be playing this game on PCs and through VR headsets, but at some point, that digital expansion is going to happen right in front of us and around us. And so uh, the idea of connecting with one of that, because that was just one person, right? Neil Armstrong uh, representing one nation on this planet. Um, this is our first time doing this, right? With, with one activity. Um, there's, there's been other humans from other nations and other, you know, corners of this, of this earth, of this planet that have done the same and are going to continue to do so. And so we're really excited about partnering and collaborating with those. Um, wanted to, to, you know, for everyone here to take note of that. The other part is, you know, in our lore, what was the history of what happened to earth, right? Of this planet. That's something to discover and to continue exploring. Um, the other part is, you know, what, um, what utility do satellites have for us today, right? If you can open up any sort of a MIT review uh, website or a Financial Times or a Discovery Channel or National Geographic, um, I, surely within the past 30 days, um, you'll see space on one of the covers. And you'll also be reading um, coverage around satellites. You know, and I think there's like three layers of where satellites are orbiting Earth. Um, the, the one closest to Earth um, is, is mainly for consumer consumption um, and uh, a little bit of like monitoring, right? So there's like espionage between countries, uh, you know, with satellites. So these satellites are really these like data centers, they're data sources, right? So we know what satellites are, what they mean to us humans today, uh, to our economies, to our uh, you know, environmental factors like the environment, for example. Um, and so, you know, how are those, how, how are, how is our time today, our present time going to imp have implications in the game in the future? I think that's super exciting, right? Um, if you're playing the game, you're, you're in Star Atlas, you're in your jet jet and bam, you instantly discover a satellite. What does that mean? What if you grab that satellite, you can, you know, somehow connect to it and you can unlock the data that was in that satellite? Well, what does that, 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 that satellite mean to your gaming position? You know, these are exciting questions that uh, we're addressing and I think, you know, could lead to something that definitely has utility in the game. Okay, okay. Thank you for the deep answer, Pavel. That was really good. So... Let me go deep. Let's go. <laughs> hey, you know what? I just want before we move on. I just want to touch on one component of that that I think is super fascinating. And it was, you know, Pablo talking about the metaverse coming down and surrounding us. And uh, so Pablo and I were on a call earlier this week with um, a an entity that produces virtual reality headsets and hardware, um, but on a level that is not. Um, not really consumer oriented. These guys are developing hardware that costs thousands of dollars that is being purchased by the US military that allows for, you know, augmented reality interaction with the real world on, uh, you know, on a, within a, a kind of sub second um, transference of data basis. And um, 
you know, the reason we're talking to groups like this and companies like that is not because it becomes consumer accessible today where you'd need a, you know, $4,000 or $5,000 computer to be able to um, appropriately utilize the hardware um, and not that people could go out and spend five or $6,000 on a VR headset, but because we, we believe that the future of the metaverse is not this distant virtual place that you enter into, uh, which was kind of our initial uh, you know, thought at Genesis was like, we are going to be going into the metaverse. It's a place that we'll experience, ha you know, encounter experiences within, uh, but we'll step back into reality. But now the thinking, <laughs> the thought process, and this was kind of an epiphany for us this week, is that uh, the, the metaverse exists already all around us. It's just a question of whether or not you have the tools available to you to be able to access that information. And so um, this kind of goes back to our ethos of, not disconnecting humans from reality and from from you know the physical world uh, to enter into some utopian or or uh, kind of alternative place where you can escape reality, but rather um, you know when you're ready, uh, you can just throw on your AR headset or your VR headset and you can start to experience the metaverse that surrounds all of us. And your daily activity will be will will uh, be. Um, uh, virtually synonymous with the activity that goes on within the metaverse. And we can tie these experiences into, um, into rewards and activities that are actually existing within the virtual universe. So uh, I know that's kind of all sounds a little bit crazy and a little bit out there, but um, we're trying to think now about what's going to be accessible to the, the human population in five years or even 10 years or maybe 15 to 20. But the way that we interact with reality is going to change substantially, drastically. And it's going to be driven by the future of AI and the future of AR and VR, as well as experiences like those we're creating within Star Atlas. So um, I, I, it's just super exciting potential. And I and, uh, wanted to share with you all uh, where our heads are kind of going and driving innovation. Yeah, there also are a lot of uh, big, companies going getting inside the metaverse for example like companies inside the fashion industry and i think each day they, they are going to be more and more getting inside the metaverse like it's going to be huge for the humanity yeah man it's pretty it's pretty wild you know again i it's uh not not to sound hipster again but we you know we we've, we've been talking about metaverses now not for a an extended length of time, but uh, you know, at least internally for eight months or nine months, and and kind of externally for the past five or six. But um, it does feel like now everybody has a metaverse play, and everybody wants uh, an avenue to connect their product or their their company, their brand to the the potential of this you know alternative virtual reality, which again we believe could actually just exist as an overlay over reality. Um, it's just a matter of switching it on or switching it off, but uh, certainly very promising. And we, we, <laughs> we feel very good about the fact that we're making the progress that we are now, given the, the kind of like the hype that's, that's propped up around it uh, more recently. Completely true. I like where this conversation is going, so I don't want to change the topic. So I will ask a question I have here about traveling inside the metaverse. So if, if, you want to travel long distance, like the longest distance available in the metaverse. Like, will it take minutes, hours, or days to travel around? At least days, for sure, if not months to years. Yeah, so think of all, all, the, all the yoga and breath work and all the type of stuff you're gonna do with the chamber and the ships. You better get ready. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. You better be flying with some friends too, because you're going to be lonely. Uh, so yeah, it, the, the traveling, um, we've been kicking around some ideas, you know, and it, depending on the type of ship that you are going to deploy, um, and the, the faction that you're going to be associated with and the sub factions with that in this manner, um, you know, there's going to be various things that you can also enjoy within, uh, your ship. So, um, yes. It's going to be a long one. You for sure want to have a Taigu next to you in a, in a long distance trip around the metaverse. So I will ask one question 
one extra question to you, Michael, and then if someone wants to ask any questions, please raise your hand. So we will let someone ask live questions to Michael and Pablo. Uh, this question has to do with the ships. Uh, will we be able to reprocess ships or modules into raw materials? This will put a floor on prices of assets that will be oversupplied, for example. There will be a lot of X4 bikes, but likely much less demand for them due to their limitations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you will be able to salvage uh, NFT assets and extract some of the input materials from it. Uh, there will be a loss rate that's applied, so it's not going to be, um, you know, call it a 100% recapture rate uh, based on the input materials of the item that you possess. But if you break down a, uh, a Pierce X4 or something, maybe that was one for free or that was relatively cheap, you'll be able to recover some percentage of those assets. And, it's, uh, and, and it might even be driven by uh, RNG, which is also, you know, probabilistic. Um, uh, or, or probability-based um, results. So maybe you get anywhere from 80% to 95% recapture rate, depending on your luck. Uh, RNG is just random number generator, but it effectively describes the, the underlying probability of achieving a result. So, um, but, but nevertheless, yes, you will be able to recapture uh, through breaking down and salvaging assets that you own. Okay, awesome, awesome. So I will repeat. If someone has any questions, we can have Michael here with us for a longer time. I have some extra questions here to ask. This one may be better for Pablo. Like, this one has to do with the Legends NFT posters. Is there any additional Legends NFT posters coming out in the near future? I don't know if Pablo, you're, you can answer to this. Uh, stay tuned. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> let, let me just elaborate um, <laughs> and say that the uh, <laughs> demand and interest in working with us is is kind of overwhelming right now. So we, you know, we want to make sure we uh, dedicate our focus to the development and delivery of uh, of the metaverse and of the mini game. And, but there's no lack of interest in producing NFTs with the Star Atlas uh, team at this at this stage. Okay, okay. So thank you again for your answer. Let's see if anyone has any questions to do. If not, we will let you go, Michael. You can grab a beer and enjoy your weekend. It is are we gonna are we gonna do a quick countdown like five, four, three, two, one? I guess it's over, right? Weekend time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll give like ten seconds from here and see if anyone has any questions and then if not we'll let you go but in all in all seriousness we uh we enjoy being up here and interacting with everyone so please uh don't be shy feel free to to drop a question raise your hand come up on stage with us uh, yeah, no questions are off limits so just just feel free to ask away and we'd love to hear from you Okay, so we can Yeah, also... just just want to give you a a shout out to Santi Santi great great work man Great work on, uh, you know, engaging with the community, being yourself and just always showing up, always being there uh, for you and your team, always killing it. And um, yeah, everyone just keep annoying Santi, okay? He, he doesn't <laughs> sleep, he, does, he doesn't need to sleep, so just keep on annoying him. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we, we will keep hosting things for the community. For example, the who wants to be an Atlationer. It, it's been a complete success. So if we keep having people joining this kind of competitions, we'll keep doing them and giving more rewards and more GC rewards with time. So we will have one extra and then we will have the Grand Metaverse final that we will have to ask Michael what kind of prices he will let us give to, to you. That's, that's, we have other things planned for the community, so if you're listening to this on YouTube, please uh, join our Discord. It, it, here is where the metaverse is happening right now. So, well, that's something I have maybe, to say. Maybe for anyone out there who's uh, not familiar, how does the uh, Who Wants to Be an Atlassian, Atlassian Air 
uh, how does the program work? How do people get involved? Uh, what's okay, the format? Okay. And what are the, yeah. what are the so this is like a quiz or trivia competition we host here on Discord. We actually, we ask like 10 questions about different categories like off topic, Stratus white paper, Solana white paper, and a lot more. And uh, you have to be quick. You need to be quick with the answer. Uh, the first people, the first person who answers right gets one point. And when we reach the 10 questions, the winner gets like a thousand Discord XP. And also we are giving some posters to the winner. So yeah, you, you need to you need to participate. I will I would like you, Michael, to, to ask some questions on the next one. You have to prepare some difficult ones. I only respond to questions. I don't ask questions. I'm but a humble servant of the uh, of the community here. Okay, okay. So I have people here saying that they can raise their hand. So I invited Funkracker, a friend of the house here on stage. How are you, man? I am fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. It's very good to be back here again on stage. I hope my connection will. Uh, carry me through a question I have for you guys. Um, so, uh, Michael, you once mentioned that available land for claims in deep space will be limited. I actually mentioned today again. Uh, it will become available based on the amount of players or GDP. Um, can you elaborate on why that limit is necessary? And does that not interfere with the exploration rule? Or, for example, if I would like to claim a system super deep in deep space where no one else would probably ever uh, uh, think to look uh, is it then is that impossible because we are limited in the amount of systems we have to begin with um and and jumping or actually yeah, just continuing that, that 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 thought if 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 you would open this space for literally tens of thousands of planets to begin with um i i understand prices may go down but will that not correct itself over time i wonder how, how you see that no, great great questions and thanks for coming back up on stage with us uh, always great to hear from you um, the, you know, where, where we have an inherent, uh, say, conflict, and I don't want to say conflict of interest, but conflict in economics is that we do want to ensure that the valuation of player assets is sustained, right? And so we, uh, we operate uh, significantly differently from traditional game uh, design studios or game development studios in that uh, every asset needs to be finite in nature. Now, that's not to say that we can't create inflation going into the future, uh, but it does conflict with the idea of this procedurally generated world wherein you can just explore out into space forever. Um, now, we want to be able to uh, encompass that feature and allow people to explore and find regions of space that are um, unoccupied and you know at low risk of being discovered. Um, you can think of the quote unquote uh, deep space or high risk space as being a blanket that envelops the entire universe itself. Um, within those, with, every, everything is encapsulated by uh, the deep space. So that's the outer reaches of the universe as well as the inner depths of the universe and then areas in between. Um, uh, where there are, you know, safer territories are in the um, uh, the faction space stations, centralized space stations, which is where everybody will begin. Um, and then the medium risk uh, envelope that kind of uh, en encapsulates the safe zone, the neutral space. Uh, and then everything else is high risk deep space. Um, again, our objective is to ensure that players or, or speculators that are purchasing assets from us have the potential for those assets to not only retain value, but potentially appreciate in value. As a result, it means that we can't just allow for this infinite expansion through procedural generation um, and, and infinite discovery of new land. We have to manage the total supply, the scarcity of assets um, alongside the growth of the user base of the game. And that's why we're looking at these econometric models to determine when we can issue new planets. Now, it's totally feasible that you as a player could go explore the outer reaches and the outer borders of the universe and continue 
to fly um, uh, uh, and navigate space and discover things like asteroid belts, for example, where perhaps you can uh, extract some value. But if we were just to allow for the infinite creation of planets and land and other types of assets, then the value across the entire economy for every player would inherently go down. And that's what we're that's what we want to avoid. So I hope that helps kind of understand why we're limiting the amount of planets uh, that are created over time. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally get it. Thanks for your for your detailed answer. I, I was just thinking, um, I mean, I yes, of course I can imagine that people would start claiming land left and right as much as they could potentially do. But of course it still means yeah, and, and perhaps that land might not be worth what they have to pay for the claim stake originally but as the player base of course grows then the land i assume close to the safe zones medium risk zones and at some point also deep space at least the closest to the to the to the edge of the medium risk will of course go up in value because people need that land and people would like to be as close as they can be to the safe zone so uh, uh, plus of course people buying claim stakes from you guys will at least also give you oh well, any money to develop the game so i i yeah, I was just wondering if that it would also be a solution. But I, I, of course, I understand that you guys looked into this deeper than I did, probably. So uh, I, I get your answer. I get your answer. Perhaps if I, I think you actually also mentioned this right now, but I, yeah, I wanted to suggest that perhaps it would be fun to, because you told the, yeah, I said the one before, if you just would continue flying out, you would just be in empty space. You know, you mentioned an asteroid belt. And I was actually thinking it would be fun at the least to, to I don't know, scatter. 10 20 100 solar systems that are crazy far out of reach and people probably never stumble upon but just at some point in far far deep empty space just so people could potentially find them just uh, to to keep uh, people a bit occupied but i think your asteroid idea is kind of kind of similar that i yeah in that uh, yeah so thanks thanks for your answer at the very least thanks no of course i i think that's an uh, kind of an interesting and novel concept uh and maybe something that people that are on with us today can benefit from is uh, maybe we will have these very hard to find Easter egg uh, galaxies that that exist out in the farthest reaches of deep space that will be difficult to discover. But uh, for those that actually do uh, identify their location, they'll be able to benefit from that. So uh, neat concept. Appreciate the uh, the suggestion, and we'll we'll, we'll discuss that internally. Um, yeah, so thank you again for, for coming up. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, I have more questions, but I, of course, we'll give the floor to others first. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Fun Cracker, for your questions. Uh, it sounds like you have big plans inside Star Atlas, man. <laughs> for sure. So here we have another Atlassian raising his hand. Let me see if I can get him on stage. Here we have, I think Pedro is your name, right? Hello. Hi. Sorry, guys. Hello. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Hi, Michael. Hi, team. I have one question regarding uh, a dark topic, depth. Uh, as we are going to play in the space, uh, it's going to be big distance from everywhere if we die where are we going to to come back to life again if i have a, a land okay i can back to back to life in my land but if an is a new player if you're going crazy to out of space where are you going to be the center of the respawn where are you going to come back to, to life that's my question yeah, yeah um great question so there there like in many mmos there will likely be uh, checkpoints that you can associate your respawn point to. Um, and, and so uh, it will really just depend on whatever your last checkpoint reserved would have been. Now, by default, that's going to be your uh, your central space station based on your faction. But if it's, if it's a planet that you possess or a space station that you possess that's uh, um, you know closer to whatever your ultimate destination is, um, and to the extent that you don't get destroyed out in deep space, so we're talking anywhere from the low risk to medium risk zone uh, and destruction of a ship uh, where you will respawn back into the game, then that would be whatever your latest checkpoint or closest uh, save point, if you will, um, 
uh, or respawn point would be, which you would have selected as a player. Okay, but is is that is going to be like a important thing? Like, if it's become very easy, oh, okay, I die. I'm going to try this, and and if I die, no worries because I'm going to I'm going to start the game again, and again I, I can try again, and again I die again, and then I can. So it's going to be like important thing if if you die, uh, look, you need to wait twelve hours to start the game again or something like that. No, so uh, where where the kind of critical decision making needs to take place is whether or not you want to operate in one of the higher risk uh, or the high risk zone of space. So uh, uh, we've we've defined three different security zones across the game, which includes a neutral zone or or no risk, low risk. Um, there's a medium risk zone. And then there's the high risk zone, which is kind of the deep space exploration where you'll be able to engage in PVP combat. Um, now, dying in low risk zone means you'll just respawn. Uh, you'll have to repair your ship. You might have to repair some of the items. Uh, so there's a cost input uh, uh, requirement, which is part of the economic decision that you have to make when you're going out and engaging the gameplay. Um, the medium risk. Your ship can be destroyed, your equipment can be taken offline, and again, you'll have to, it will be, probably be a more considerable cost to repair your items than if you were to die in the low risk space. But in deep space, in the high risk zone, uh, there is permanent death. So losing an engagement means you actually lose your NFT that you invested hard capital into. Uh, so it, it's, it's, just going to be a question of how risk seeking or how risk averse are you as a player and how confident are you in your ability to survive and navigate the high risk zone of space. Okay, thank you. That's that was my question for today. Uh, thank you for all and see you on the 15th of August. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Man. So we also have here on stage the real AJL. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. All right. Uh, I'm a team. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to ask a question. Um, uh, Michael, you said any question was uh, possible. So um, I was intrigued by a tweet post uh, uh, earlier. Uh, you stated technology and spirituality, science and art, self and other individual and collective, we are all connected. And it resonates uh, with me very much. Uh, and I was wondering, will these other areas, so besides technology, uh, also be, be developed as playable elements of Star Atlas? That's a great question, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can can you kind of restate uh, just so I make sure that I answer? Well, on, on, on Twitter earlier, you stated uh, technology and spirituality, science and art, self and other individual and collective we are all connected connected and will these other areas so uh the spiritual area uh the science the, the art area also be developed as playable elements within star atlas did you understand the question or should i elaborate i think you're muted oh. michael yeah sorry about that um yeah, I, I, if, if you can elaborate, it really is a good question. And I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand with, uh, so from the standpoint of like spirituality, are you suggesting that, uh, or are you asking whether or not we'll have some uh, spiritual elements of reality developed into the game that would also be uh, characteristics or skills or traits that can be enhanced and leveled up? Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. One of the uh, on on one of the contests, I have suggested, I made a suggestion. For instance, uh, an NFT that will be a device which enhances remote viewing, uh, powered by the power of the mind or rechargeable via uh, mind-specific tasks. Um, so it's 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 it was a, a wild idea uh, of me back then. But 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 yeah, will there be elements? Uh, related to, to art or spirituality or, or science, eh? not as in technology, um, be part of the game. Yeah, um, that that's that's deep. Um, it's a really fantastic question. Something I think for us to continue to or well uh, to consider at least initially, um, where we are tying in uh, kind of societal uh, uh, 
skills, if you will, is through a reputation system. So every player, every character will have a persistent reputation that will be tracked based on the types of acti activities uh, they engage in within the game. And so that could be, you know, if you're a pirate, your, your reputation score is going to go down as somebody that would be trustworthy uh, within the universe that is Star Atlas. Um, uh, some of the other um, kind of scenarios you described are a bit more obscure and it would be it may be difficult to quantify, but uh, I, you know, worth exploring. So, Santi Pablo, let's let's uh, let's let's grab a note on that one and and maybe discuss that internally. <laughs> yeah, I think Pablo will will have like a more deep answer on this. I don't know if Pablo, if you're if you're still here. Yeah, I know for sure. I mean, I guess how you know we went talking about incorporating recovery zones in some of the ships, so like recovery chambers where. We could have um, things like light therapy, for example, um, or you know some more like enhanced digital therapeutics. And so, if there if there are part, like you know if we can incorporate uh, somehow this this uh, gaming loop of you know getting a score for meditating, right? Like I, I think meditation is or breath work. Um, like how many breath work and me or meditation uh, uh, you know sessions do you have during your game? Um, that might create more focus, more creativity in your strategy. Um, just being an overall better player or uh, faction uh, uh, team member, right? And so mm -hmm. when we kind of when we think about like what could be all the variables or all, all the data points uh, for a reputation score, for example, or just a social score in the game, um, I think I think that's that's kind of like where things could get really interesting. I'm like just being an overall uh, better, uh, you know, uh, star citizen, right? Star uh, Atlassian, and and I think that like, yeah, I, I think there's a lot there that we could do. Um, it just it's more about you know when do we want to roll out these features and and, and how yeah and, and and how do we actually implement them within this gaming loop, but. Uh, yeah, no, for sure, man. Lo I love that approach. Love that in, uh, in in this world. And I think overall, um, it, it would just be a m much better vibe, you know, um, across the board. It, it, it's 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 a growing development uh, as we speak of now uh, throughout the whole world. So it it would benefit the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it, and if you succeed, I'm your biggest fan. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, you know, we will we'll, we definitely have it on on the roadmap, um, and we 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 definitely have the type of soundboard that could really execute this, also from like a, um, a psychological uh, standpoint and therapeutic standpoint. Um, you know, in regards to like doctors and therapists, and 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 these uh, you know different mindsets that could enhance um, that experience. Yeah. Okay. No, great. Thanks for your answer. In other words, uh, we are openly accepting applications to the cult. <laughs> okay, okay. So this was a great question. We went really, really deep into it. Thanks, Pablo. As always, you are the, the, the meditative mindset here, and we, we love your answers. So, Michael, I don't know if you still have time. We are already like an hour into the town hall. I don't know if you have to jump on a call or something. We know you, you're a very busy person. We have one hand raised. If you want to answer one extra question, just let me know. Yeah, I, I think we would be remiss not to uh, uh, allow Fun Cracker here to uh, ask one more question. I think Anthony is probably randomly stumbling here. Uh, we're, we're, let's take one more question. I, the hands are popping up now, but uh, we do have to <laughs> pop on next, but let's take one more. Uh, yeah. And depending on how long that takes, we will potentially answer the second yeah. one, but we'll cut it there. Yeah, yeah. So we will take Funk Crackers one because he has raised his hand since he left the stage. So we'll invite him into stage. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, Welcome I, again. I, Questions. Thank you very much for allowing me back on stage. My connection seems a bit more unstable, so I hope I will uh, hang on. So I'll be quick with my asking uh, my question. 
Um, so there has been some talk in the past about uh, um, DAX, uh, corporations in the game, to have their own SPL token and somehow integrated that token in the game. Uh, and my question is, will DAX get the opportunity from within the game to mint their own SPL token? As in, will you, are you contemplating to facilitate that yourself? Or if you set up a token out of the game, can we connect that to the game in a way? Um, and what functionality do you foresee for these uh, tokens, if any? Any info about our process would be appreciated. Thank you. I think it's I think it's a really cool concept that came up on Twitter um, maybe two days ago now. Uh, I think uh, Anatoly had mentioned something about clan tokens. We first of all, from a from a ideological standpoint, would fully support it. Uh, you know the whether or not we introduce the functionality that that makes it seamless for players to create their own governance token for their clan or not, um, or you know, internal yeah. clan currency, if you will, uh, is, is yet to be determined. We could probably do it, although it's also relatively simple to mint a token on Solana. So it would be completely feasible for a clan to create their own internal currency. That could be one application of it, or um, you know, alternatively, it would be a separate governance token or DAO-like token, similar to how we're launching Polis, that actually enables the player to um, uh, or enables the clan to distribute proceeds from uh, uh, their their excursions and expeditions and, and exploits of the universe, if you will. So um, the idea would be that a clan could manage a centralized treasury. All of this exists on chain. All of it exists in a in a fully decentralized fashion, and um, it would be completely possible for them to manage their own governance token that determines. Uh, maybe the progression of the clan or direction of the clan, whether or not somebody gets uh, gets uh, recruited, where they operate in space, any number of decisions that could be voted upon as a result of the governance token. And then also, you know, where it's, I think, very important is, is in kind of financial return and economic decisions of the clan, which is, uh, you know, could be determined based on uh, whether or not a clan and the uh, taxes generated within a clan should be utilized to purchase more assets or simply distribute it out to players. So those would be some of the areas or or, or methods that I think people could utilize these tokens. Um, uh, uh, again, it, that could be created completely external from us and any features that we introduce. Uh, it could be managed entirely on a separate website that is dedicated to the clan. But um, you know, we would put some consideration or thought into uh, how easily do we make this accessible to clans as a, you know, kind of one click deployment of, of a new token or something of that fashion, as well as uh, perhaps being able to provide some guidance on general governance policy, or, it, you know, you could consider it effectively corporate policy that gets implemented, and we could provide some guidelines around surrounding that. So, um, not, not again, not an immediate focus for us, but something we could assist with, although it could be executed completely independent of us and there's there's no way that we could prevent it and there's no reason why we would want to prevent that. Yeah, thanks very much for a detailed answer again. You're completely right, of course, and, and what, 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 yeah, what, what interests me is exactly like if, you, if you allow this, how uh, or what, what options you foresee to perhaps really integrate a bit more into the game. But I, from your uh, answer, I understand that that is something you're uh, uh, perhaps contemplating, not only with roadmap, so I get that perhaps later on. Thank you very much for answering. My pleasure. Uh, thanks again for the great question. We do, unfortunately, have to uh, to, to take another uh, call right now, winding down our Friday. But uh, thank you, everyone, for the, the great questions, for the interactivity, for all of your support. Thank you, Santi. You're doing a fantastic job up here. Uh, uh, as the moderator of, of these town halls. So uh, looking you, forward Michael. to the next one. Thank you, thank you. So I will like to end this uh, telling everybody to, if you're listening to this on YouTube, we want you to join our Discord to to come here and compete in the Atlassian air, to, to speak with the community, to interact. We have here Discord XP that will be later exchangeable for, for example, early access and other cool stuff. So, I invite everyone to come here and have fun with us while we all wait for the mini game and the game release. Santi, Santi, Santi. <laughs> <laughs>
Be the man. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Pablo. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us today.